Thanks so much for the invitation. It's so lovely to be here and to hear such a spirited and animated discussion. Um, it was great actually to be here this morning and just to see um, what kind of makeup of the audience it is because it allows me just to pitch the, 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 the talk. Um, I'm ta I've titled it Next Year and Next Decade and it was interesting listening to Linda Gale now saying that you discussed it seven years ago and it's important for us to understand that these long-acting antiretrovirals are not here and they're several years away and they may well be 10 or 15 years away at the rate we're going at the moment. So I just want to talk about why that is and the development of, of, of them. And I just also want to talk about some quite simple concepts because even I did not know this stuff. When I was putting this lecture together, um, it's, a, it's a variant of what I did a couple of weeks ago. Um, I don't think I quite understood what this is. And firstly, the term long acting is a very loose term, but generally it means anything lasting more than a week. And it's not just injectables. It can also be things you swallow. And it's things you implant. It can actually take it in forms of even patches and things like that. So these things just last a long time. You can take it, as I said, orally, intramuscularly. It can be as a subcutaneous um, injection just under the skin. Um, or it can be implantable. So it's, it's very similar to, in many ways to contraception. Um, the current antiretrovirals, the ones we use for the treatment of HIV, um, um, and the ones we use for PrEP, the, uh, the currently widely used ones, are all dosed orally as tablets, conventional tablets. Um, we may be able to decrease the doses of some of them, um, to, uh, the treatment ones, to maybe three or four times a week, just because of the, uh, once you've, you've suppressed your virus. But by and large, that's generally the paradigm that we're using. So what are we talking about practically when we talk about long acting? And it's very important that we understand that the number of drugs we're talking about is actually very, very small at the moment. Um, there are only three registered formulations. And that actually shocked me when I had to get my head around that because the way people talk about long acting is we've been talking about long acting for over a decade now. There are only three. And they're quite specific. We're talking about cabotegravir, which is you know, the hot drug of the moment. Um, for PrEP. Now, cabotegravir is dosed for PrEP every two months. Um, a, there is a little bit of work hoping that we can get to three monthly, which would help us a lot. Um, and that's given as a muscular injection. You know, again, very similar to many of the, the contraception um, formulations. We can use cabotegravir for treatment with another quite an old drug called Rilpivirine. Um, this injection is given as two separate injections. And again, it's important for us to get our heads around this because you must remember in our African situation, imagine getting your injections in a rural clinic. These are two separate injections in two separate places in your bum, okay? Um, they are two different sites. The rural privilege injection needs a cold chain at this point, and it's quite an painful injection, the Rolpivirine one. The Capitagravir one is less, in, uh, less painful. They tend to get less painful with time. The first one is pretty painful, the next one less painful, and so on and so on. And you can't give it to, to the hands of an untrained healthcare worker. You also can't self-administer at this point. There is work being done to try to get it to self-administer. Um, but And at the moment, the drugs are pretty expensive. It's much more expensive than oral therapy. There's another drug called Lenacapavir, which is made by a different company, and unfortunately this is important because of the politics between the various companies. And this is given as a subcutaneous injection, usually into your tummy, just um, around your belly button. Um, and it's used at this point only for treatment. It's been explored in some very big studies and looks very promising for prevention, and you must watch the space. But it's used only for treatment experienced patients, patients with lots of drug resistance. And there are actually very few of those patients in our context um, that would be eligible. And certainly my country in South Africa, which is a very large program, we don't actually use this drug because we have so many other drugs that we can use. Um, and you use it with daily tablets. So it's not really that useful, which is why we, we don't use it um, in South Africa. We've got a couple of drugs in the pipeline. There's a drug called Islatrovir. Unfortunately, this drug was being used as an implant for, um, for pre prevention. There, there was some toxicity associated with it two years ago, which means that it's no longer in, um, in development for prevention. There was some excitement that we might even be able to use it for long-acting for treatment. But we are, it got dropped because of this. 
it is being used as a um, as a daily tablet, um, and it, there's an idea that we could use it. It's been tested at the moment as a weekly tablet with lenacapavir, so six monthly subcutaneous injection and a weekly tablet, which is something we've never done before. So you must think for yourself: if you were on, if you had, if you had HIV, would you prefer to take a daily tablet every day? It's quite simple. Or would you come in for a six monthly injection below your skin here and take a weekly tablet maybe every Sunday? I don't know. I, I don't know what I would prefer if it was me. Um, the, the studies that are available for this will only be in the, in, in the next one to two months. Um, and it's not clear to me that whether this is something we would want or would need or would be supported. There are lots of other compounds being explored at the moment, but even if they make their way through the systems, it's only two or three years before it gets reported. There's the usual stuff, we're going to need pregnancy data, we're going to need all sorts of other data. So it's maybe six, seven, eight, ten years before these compounds are actually available. Why is everyone so excited about long actings? Now, most of you will get this like that. Now, I think it's been interesting for me because health care workers often don't get it, is that patients absolutely love this stuff. And um, that's despite it being painful injections. We've been using these drugs in our clinic for a couple of um, years now in various studies, including a large one with Sissy Ketcher from, from Uganda. And people tell me men don't like injections. I tell you men love these injections. Um, there is, adolescents love these injections. Everyone loves these injections. People prefer this over taking oral tablets, certainly in other studies that we've been doing. There's all the issues around stigma, the issues around carrying these tablets, being reminded every day of your HIV status when you're for treatment. For prevention, we've had really good results. Um, in the studies that have been done in the 084 study in South Africa. So, you know, I think patients have leapt forward ahead of their healthcare workers in terms of embracing this stuff. There are some operational questions. It's all very well to say the patients love this stuff, but I don't know, you know, certainly in South Africa where we've managed to get the tablets out into the communities, where we distribute them in the pharmacies close to their homes, will they love it as much if they have to come back every two months? We distribute the tablets to them every three, sometimes every six months when we're really good at our jobs. Will they like coming back to get two injections every two months rather than just getting the tablets to be, um, distributed to them every three or every six months? I'm not so sure. But we're getting these new drugs coming. So if we're lucky and we get like tablets, you know, perhaps that we give you once every week or tablets even once a month, can you imagine being given like six tablets to take once a month, you know, or getting an implant that you take once every year for your treatment. It's, it really is transformative, and you can imagine how, why people are so excited. And it's not just HIV that's excited. We're looking at it for hepatitis C. We're looking at even for TB. There's a whole channel of drugs that are starting to look at these new technologies to start making drugs last longer and longer. And I think over the next 10 years, things are going to transform dramatically. In some ways, in places like hepatitis C, they're even more advanced than HIV. HIV is taking a long time to move forward with um, the studies that are taking these drugs forward. We've had a lot of problems with adherence in certain areas of HIV. One of them has been with PrEP. And that's why the 083 and 084 and the Cabotegravir PrEP studies have been so exciting because we've managed to get on top of some of these adherence challenges. Um, the areas in treatment, and particularly amongst adolescents, where treatment has been a real real issue and I've seen some of the discussions coming up here over the last day that you've been, you've, I've been here and I think that that's one area where cabotegravir in particular in combination with some of these drugs might be very useful and some we've been having some discussions here. There's also people who have chaotic lives and this happens in adults. People just they can make the appointment but they can't take the tablet every day um, and we see this particularly in drug using com um, communities. People who we benefit from coming in, getting the jab there and then, and then getting on for the next two months, and they'll see you in two months' time. And perhaps those are communities that could be prioritized for these, for these interventions. And we've seen some success in both rich countries and in lower middle income countries with this approach. There's some big thorns out there. There's all the usual pol politics of drug companies and intellectual property issues. We've had some real issues with getting access to cabotegravir, um, the, and we still, it's unclear to me why there's been such a big issue, but we've known that cabotegravir works for a long time, but we're still battling to get access to the drug for operational drugs, um, for operational studies. Um, 
we are talking to big companies like Gilead around getting access to Leonard Capovir there, and we're still going to need those drugs for the various operational studies um, and for how to actually use it in our context. There's a lot of things around cost, and those things are going forward, and there's a lot of modeling work that's been done, the medicine's patent pool is getting involved, um, there's a lot of advocacy that is being done, possibly not nearly enough, and it's not coordinated, I'm going to talk about it in a moment. Um, the generic companies are getting involved very late in the game. Women are still not prioritized enough. We're very lucky to have the Lena Capovir and Cabotegavir PrEP studies because we're getting lots of pregnancy data from that. But for the other drugs, we're going to have precious little data on women because these companies always test it on gay white men in the north before they come down here and then do natural history experiments in the process. There's real issues around resistance, and I've just come from the resistance conference, Linda Gale and I, and there were real breakthroughs on the Rolpivirine Cabotegravir combination. This is not an ideal combination for any setting. These were breakthrough combination um, um, setting in, uh, breakthroughs in rich countries with very, very high, well-trained healthcare workers with lots and lots of resources. In our settings, that's a real concern, and I think it's something we're going to have to talk about when we start rolling out these combinations in populations who don't have the support that they have. One of the things I do want to talk about, though, is coordination. And I think Cabotegravir is a very good example in getting it through. And I was part of the Dolitegravir um, introduction, as you heard from Lloyd, and it was coordinated. It wasn't perfect, but we worked together as an international community to get Dolitegravir through the door. And I'm proud to say that it came through the door. It could have gone quicker, certainly in South Africa, but the rest of the world managed to get, certainly Africa and Asia managed to get it through the door. But we're not seeing that with the injectables and we're not seeing that with Cabotegravir. We're seeing the researchers almost like we did their research and they were like, oh, we got a really good result, now what? No one planned for success. We still are years and years away from seeing Cabotegravir for PrEP being implemented in any form, even in rich countries. There's hardly any of it going out there. Um, and that we were told in the Brisbane conference that there will be a small amount made available in 2007. You know, th we need hundreds of millions of people to be on this drug um, by 2007. It looks like they're going to be a few thousand. And again, it's just like we, no one planned for this to actually be successful. Um, we're seeing PrEP people going ahead, doing their own thing. The treatment people, are, again, they're going to need tens of millions of people to be on this drug soon. And there's no coordination around that. And what does that mean for volumes and for dealing with generic companies? The implementation researchers, Glinda Gale and myself, are just two of them, are having to beg for enough drug to actually look, do studies to actually show how we do this stuff in our context, in low and middle income countries. How do you do it in primary healthcare clinics? You know, so anyone can make it happen in a clinical trials unit. But how do we do it where the cold chains are not working, where you know, staff are not going to be able to, are, are in busy clinics and built with long queues? And the generic companies have only just been engaged and it takes years for them to buy the equipment. Many of them don't look like, like they really want to do this. And it's difficult for me to understand is like why did, was there no one thinking about this going forward, that the generic companies would have to be one of the ones um, part of the process and all of this. There's no clear coordination with guidelines, certainly in my country. It's like no one at the government level is really like thinking about this in a joined up way between PrEP and with treatment. And there's no clear coordination until very recently with the major donors and the major funders of, of treatment programs. There's no one person who's leading all of this. And that we did have with Dolitegravir. We had everyone in the room together. It was difficult, it wasn't perfect, but it, it all happened. And it took a few years. And we're not seeing that with the long-acting injectables. But I think just to end up, the major challenges are going to be systemic. We've got a very complex um, health system um, challenge. We're introducing these injections into health systems that don't like complexity. You have to ask yourself about taking uh, a trained nurse to give two different injections to selected patients in primary health care is going to be hard. We had difficulty enough in the old days giving efavirenz and nivirapine to the uh, And this is where I think it is going to be important to, for us to work out what we're going to do here. PrEP has actually been a failure across the, the world. Outside of Paris and San Francisco and a few selected verticalized programs, it really hasn't worked. And I think we need to ask some harsh questions about how we're going to make this work. It doesn't mean we can't. It just means we mustn't like, just mouth rhetoric about how we're going to make this work this time. And maybe Cabotegravir is the drug that is going to help us get this right. And there are reasons, I think, that we could make it. We do have time. And it's not 
good news that we have time. It's because everyone's been sitting on their hands around this. But we probably have four or five years before we're going to have mass access to, to injectable cabotigivir at scale. And during that time, we're really going to have to learn very, very quickly um, how to use these drugs. I think that demonstration projects for PrEP around cabotigivir, we, even if it's not the perfect drug, start learning how we're going to administer this. And I think the adolescent communities are certainly great places because they're complicated communities that we can start looking at. And then the treatments. And again, I think adolescents should probably be one of the priority communities that we can start testing these in. Um, Pablo and I have been talking for the last year about how we can, we can start doing demo projects in, the, in these groups. And I think that we can start saying that this. So we have this time. We need to get ahead of the curve in terms of advocacy and start looking at these IP issues, start questioning why this thing is proving so difficult when we've had actually quite a good relationship with many of the of the originator companies in terms of getting access to these drugs. Why is it proving so hard with these long-acting injectables? And start working like an international community like in the old days um, that we did have. And asking for the transparency that's been lacking around these, these long-actings. Anticipating that some of the drug companies that we've worked with in the past are not going to be the one developing them. There's a whole lot of companies making drugs that we haven't worked with traditionally and may not understand the way we've, we've worked with as a community in the past. Keep your eyes on the safety um, studies. They'll keep testing this on white men going forward until somebody like shouts at them loud enough. And we will not get the pregnancy data that we need and the data on women that we need to get this to scale it in our, in our communities. And then think how guidelines should approach this. And finally, just learn the operational issues because that's going to be the Achilles heel. We, can, we could have Capitegravir and Lenacapavir available tomorrow at mass scale at no cost. And we would have no idea how to do this. No one would get the drug because that's the stuff that is really hard, is how to get the drugs into our community practically and provide it. And I think those are the, the lessons that, um, the, the unsexy stuff, it's all very well to go and run big studies that show the stuff works. The really operational studies are where the rubber hits the road. And that's the stuff we must be thinking about is how do we engage with our ministries of health? How do we talk to the people on the ground, the healthcare workers and the communities and get, make sure that they're enthusiastic when this stuff hits. Make sure that we're not sitting having the same conversation in 10 years time. Thanks very much.